Hi, here in this video, let's see In Celebration of Being Alive by Dr. Christian Bernard, which is based on the idea of suffering and not getting troubled by its thoughts. Doctor acknowledged that the kids had taught him that the business of living is joy in the real sense, not simply pleasure, amusement, recreation, but more of a celebration of being alive. Let's look at the complete topic. In Celebration of Being Alive by Dr. Christian Barnard About the author Christian Barnard, 1922-2001 was a South African heart surgeon who did the world's first successful human heart transplant operation. He was born on 8 November 1992 in Beaufort West, Cape Province, South Africa. His father was a church pastor and his family was not rich. Barnard has penned 14 books and 235 scientific articles that have been published in reputed journals. Some of his books are One Life, 50 Ways to a Healthy Heart, The Best Medicine, and The Faith. A pioneer in cardiac surgery, he obtained a doctorate in medicine from the University of Cape Town. This was followed by 11 honorary doctorates bestowed upon him by universities all over the world. He has also received 36 international awards. Let's look at the lesson. In Celebration of Being Alive By Dr. Christian Barnard More and more, as I near the end of my career as a heart surgeon, my thoughts have turned to the consideration of why people should suffer. Suffering seems so cruelly prevalent in the world today. Do you know that of the 125 million children born this year, 12 million are unlikely to reach the age of one and another 6 million will die before the age of five? And, of the rest, many will end up as mental or physical cripples. My gloomy thoughts probably stem from an accident I had a few years ago. One minute I was crossing the street with my wife after a lovely meal together. And the next minute a car had hit me and knocked me into my wife. She was thrown into the other lane and struck by a car coming from the opposite direction. During the next few days in the hospital, I experienced not only agony and fear but also anger. I could not understand why my wife and I had to suffer. I had 11 broken ribs and a perforated lung. My wife had a badly fractured shoulder. Over and over, I asked myself, why should this happen to us? I had work to do, after all. There were patients waiting for me to operate on them. My wife had a young baby who needed her care. My father, had he still been alive, would have said, My son, it's God's will. That's the way God tests you. Suffering ennobles you. Makes you a better person. But, as a doctor, I see nothing noble in a patient's thrashing around in a sweat-soaked bed. Mind clouded in agony. Nor can I see any nobility in the crying of a lonely child in a ward at night. In those days, they didn't have sophisticated heart surgery. I have always found the suffering of children particularly heartbreaking, especially because of their total trust in doctors and nurses. They believe you are going to help them, if you can't they accept their fate. They go through mutilating surgery, and afterwards they don't complain. One morning, several years ago, I witnessed what I call the Grand Prix of Cape Town's Red Cross Children's Hospital. It opened my eyes to the fact that I was missing something in all my thinking about suffering. Something basic that was full of solace for me. What happened there that morning was that a nurse had left a breakfast trolley unattended. And very soon this trolley was commandeered by an intrepid crew of two. A driver and a mechanic. The mechanic provided motor power by galloping along behind the trolley with his head down. While the driver, seated on the mower deck, held on with one hand and steered by scraping his foot on the floor. The choice of roles was easy because the mechanic was totally blind and the driver had only one arm. They put on quite a show that day, judging by the laughter and shouts of encouragement from the rest of the patients. It was a much better entertainment than anything anyone puts on at the Indianapolis 500 car race. There was a grand finale of scattered plates and silverware before the nurse and ward sister caught up with them, scolded them and put them back to bed. Let me tell you about these two. The mechanic was all of seven years old. One night, 
When his mother and father were drunk, his mother threw a lantern at his father. Mist and the lantern broke over the child's head and shoulders. He suffered severe third-degree burns on the upper part of his body, and lost both his eyes. At the time of the Grand Prix, he was a walking horror. With a disfigured face and long flap of skin hanging from the side of his neck to his body. As the wound healed around his neck, his lower jaw became gripped in a mass of fibrous tissue. The only way this little boy could open his mouth was to raise his head. When I stopped by to see him after the race, he said, You know, we won. And he was laughing. The trolley's driver I knew better. A few years earlier, I had successfully closed a hole in his heart. He had returned to the hospital because he had a malignant tumor of the bone. A few days before the race, his shoulder and arm were amputated. There was little hope of his recovery. After the Grand Prix, he proudly informed me that the trolley's wheels were not properly oiled. But he was a good driver, and he had full confidence in the mechanic. Suddenly, I realized that these two children had given me a profound lesson in getting on with the business of living. Because the business of living is joy in the real sense of the word, not just something for pleasure, amusement, recreation. The business of living is the celebration of being alive. I had been looking at suffering from the wrong end. You don't become a better person because you are suffering. But you become a better person because you have experienced suffering. We can't appreciate light if we haven't known darkness. Nor can we appreciate warmth if we have never suffered cold. These children showed me that it's not what you've lost that's important. What is important is what you have left. About the lesson. Summary of the topic. Dr. Barnard met with a road accident once. When he was crossing the road along with his wife. A car hit him and knocked him into his wife. She was thrown on the other line on was hit by a car from the opposite direction. Barnard suffered from fractured ribs and a perforated lung. His wife had a fractured shoulder. When Barnard was in the hospital, he reflected on what his father would have said. Suffering is God's way of testing, refining, purifying, and ennobling us. Barnard did not see anything noble about a patient suffering or a child crying with pain in a hospital. One day, Barnard's father showed him a half-eaten biscuit. It was the last one his brother had had before he died of a heart problem. Barnard found the suffering of children miserable. Children implicitly trust doctors and nurses believing that they can help them. Even if they can't help them, they accept their fate. Several years earlier, Dr. Barnard had witnessed what he called a Grand Prix. Two boys tried to drive the breakfast trolley in the hospital. One of them, a handicapped boy acted as a driver and other one, a blind boy provided the motor power by working as a mechanic. The other patients joined in the fun and play, till the plates were scattered. The mechanic was a seven-year-old boy. His mother has thrown a lantern at his father. The lantern had misses its mark and had broken on the boy's head, resulting in severe burns. And loss of eyesight. At that time of the Grand Prix, he was a sight to look at. The driver was another child who had been earlier operated upon by Dr. Barnard for the hole in his heart. He was in the hospital now, for a dreadful bone disease. His shoulder and arm had been cut off. There was little hope of his recovery. Dr. Barnard learned an important lesson about life from these two boys. The business of living, is the celebration of being alive. He realized that it is not what you have lost that is important. But what you have been left with. Light can't be appreciated without knowing darkness. Nor can warmth be, without experiencing coldness. End of the analysis.